Um, and now, let's hear from Martin Stewart-Weeks. Martin is the Director of Cisco Internet Business Solutions. Martin, we stand here at the edge of our own adventure. Um, what's happening internationally? Um, a lot, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, but uh, thanks for the opportunity to come and contribute. And, you know, as a co-author of uh, the piece of work that Tim has just said, I guess I should start by saying everything that he just said. I definitely agree with all of that. Um, so I've got three things I want to say and make a couple of quick comments about each, but I'm going to top and tail the conversation with a couple of kind of mantras, if you like, a couple of observations. The first is that, uh, to me, the best way of summing up what cities are for is to remember that they are essentially about three things. Commerce, creativity and community. And the point I'm going to make and the point that I think you probably don't need to have made in this, in this uh, room, but I'm going to reinforce it, is that the digital dimension disrupts not only each of those three, but the way those three interact to make cities work. <coughs> Commerce, creativity, community. The digital dimension is disrupting each of them and the way they interact. So that's kind of my top mantra, and I'll finish with another one, uh, just a kind of summary uh, about a theme that I think is behind all of this, which is a theme of resilience, which I'll come back to in a minute. So three quick data points, because that's what they say in Cisco you're supposed to start with. I think that just means pieces of information, but I'll call them a data point anyway. So here's the first one, and they're all from either Cisco or Cisco Commission uh, research, uh, third-party research. By 2014, there'll be more than 5 billion personal devices connected to mobile networks, as will, of course, billions more sensors and other devices. The famous internet of everything, which is a phraseology we like to describe these days, um, is here. Um, and it'll get uh, only more rapid. Uh, the second data point, smartphones, uh, I'm told, by this particular piece of research, I have references that I can share, uh, will generate an average of 42 times more mobile traffic in 2014 than they did just in tw uh, 2009. So that's just a smartphone revolution on its own. And the third data point, which I think is particularly interesting, is one that um, is very close to a, a number of people's heart, I guess, uh, in the technology sector, which is that um, the prediction is that by 2015, something like 90% of internet data is going to be video or video connected. So here's my first proposition. I have to say it slowly because it's a bit of a tongue twister, but it kind of sums it up in one phrase. Digital disrupts and deep digital disrupts deeply. <laughs> to say that very slowly, but just... <laughs> Digital disrupts, we know that, but I think the point that I want to make, and I want to come <coughs> to a point, my second observation is why it's so hard to actually translate this into policy making, but deep digital uh, disrupts deeply. So I think the point we're making, and Tim's already put a few uh, uh, um, bits of evidence in front of you, and I've thrown a couple at you as well, there is now inescapable and compelling evidence that this game is on and on seriously. The digital economy, it seems to me, ought to be and is increasingly the starting point. It's not an exotic or peripheral uh, a piece of um, a discussion that happens on the edge. In that sense, it seems to me, the conversation about the digital domain has moved from the exotic edge to the, to the centre. There's, there's, a, there's a paradox about this, though. So I think that's actually what's happening in the world. Uh, I think the consequence we've heard a bit about already from Tim, the rise of something we like to call digital urbanism, but I think there is a caution, and in the paper we've written, and many of you will know her work, Saskia Sasson, the sociologist, has actually taken Cisco and many other technology companies some, somewhat to task uh, because there is a sense in which we have failed, as she describes it, to urbanise technology. In other words, the smart city debate has been a little guilty, and I think this is true, uh, of assuming that the technology is somehow the point. And her point is, uh, not a difficult one to grasp, obviously, but it's a very important one, is that unless we can urbanise technology to the contours of the way that people actually do live or want to live, work, play, connect, govern, whatever, then it's not going to work. Uh, so I think that caution is a very important one because it may be that that's part of the problem that is seeing us stuck, not taking full advantage, perhaps, of the, of the trend. So that's the first observation, digital disrupts, deep digital disrupts deeply. My second observation, though, would, would be that the DNA of policy and professional practice is very, very tough to change. Despite the evidence around them, and having worked in the New South Wales Cabinet Office in the past and in various other parts of what one might call the belly of the beast in public policy making, it is astonishing to me, and I'm going to be reasonably provocative at this point, how difficult it is to convince mainstream 
decision makers that what's going on outside their buildings is actually true and real and is actually changing the world. Because when you look at the evidence of their work, and I'm going to pick three, they're not actually international, but I'm going to pick three. Uh, one would be the Metropolitan Strategy, that's just recently been announced. Another would be the, uh, the plan from Infrastructure New South Wales, which I think is kind of edging in the right direction. Um, and another would be a really interesting conversation that the committee held recently with Western Sydney. We had Kerry Bartlett from Wesrock talking about the problems at Western Sydney. We talked about traffic and we talked about jobs and we talked about all those things. And for the life of me, I was waiting there for somebody to say, shouldn't we have a little bit of a look about the way people actually do work and connect and move and, and uh, engage with other people? Because it is shifting, isn't it? So I guess my second observation would be, and perhaps we can tease this out a little in the conversation, is despite the fact that we are not only learning that deep digital disrupts deeply, we're experiencing, for goodness sake, every day of our lives, when you get inside the sort of citadels of policy making, either in government or sometimes in the private sector, including in the development industry and elsewhere, it's almost like that conversation isn't there. It's like, it's, so I feel strangely schizophrenic in the role that I play in a company who lives and breathes this stuff all the time, and then I go out and talk to senior uh, bureaucrats and ministers and others, and I wonder whether they're listening to the same... But, you know, perhaps the problem is, as they say in Cisco, I'm drinking too much of my own Kool-Aid. Maybe that's the problem. Maybe this is not real. Maybe it's not true at all. But I think we've got a problem. So the world is inexorably, it seems to me, launched on a, a trajectory which a sort of a deep DNA of policy-making uh, is finding difficult to accommodate and translate. And my third observation that I'd make before I come to my sort of concluding little mantra uh, is that fundamentally we are seeing the way in which digital, the digital dimension is reshaping uh, the life and the shape, physical shape, as well as the sort of uh, uh, human shape uh, of cities and communities. And there are four areas I'll touch on very quickly. Work, learning, services and governance. I won't say a lot about governance because uh, Tim has talked a lot about that already and I think it's a, it's a critical part. The work thing is fascinating. In fact, one of the reasons that Cisco got engaged with this network in the first place was really off the back of the telework, smart work, flexible work kind of conversation. There's lots of different names for it these days. Um, but essentially this idea, uh, and I'm sure Brad's going to tell us a lot more about how this actually works in practice, but this notion that we are finally arrived at a situation where there are now more than two propositions about where you can actually engage work. It's not just about the office or home. It's about the office and home and about 6,600 other permutations of place and connectivity that you can now harness in order to be not just connected technically, so, you know, connectivity, can I, will the phone work, can I get a, 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 a WebEx session going or a Skype session going, but connected to other people as well. That conversation has completely exploded, it seems to me, off the back of the digital dimension. And the world of work is now grappling with the fact that we are now faced with the prospect, not just of doing the work we used to do differently, but actually beginning to think about doing different work. And certainly thinking about doing different types and styles of work in a way which is very, very disruptive. And I knew this conversation was starting to get uh, serious when I had an interesting chat the other day with some folks in the Department of Premier and Cabinet here, who in New South Wales, who are about to move to a new premises in uh, 52 Martin Place, and the entire building is going to be uh, activated on an activity-based working model, and they're going to essentially use the opportunity to blow up the structure, at, the physical structure, and therefore they hope the culture um, of an organisation that is actually right at the heart of the system. So maybe, in fact, there is some beginning, some shift. So that's one, one issue. Work, the life of work, and the way that impacts cities bearing in mind that most of us spend most of our time moving around cities or engaging with cities because of work. Uh, it's a huge part of our lives. That's one bit. Learning is the next bit. You have to say something about learning, I think, given that we're in the middle of a, a particularly impressive seat of learning uh, in a university. I mean, I don't need to tell Ross and others because they've often told us about the way in which the digital dimension is completely reshaping the conversation about how people learn, where they learn, where they want, what they learn, and how they learn from each other uh, within, the, within the university, outside the bounds of the university, and so on and so forth. We're having similar conversations at the moment with the University of Western Sydney. Completely new models, distributed learning centres they're talking about. It's already got five campuses anyway, so it's already that kind of network building. We've all heard a lot about the rise and rise of MOOCs uh, and massive online courses and all that kind of stuff. So just as a headline, I'll throw those thoughts at you. 
but the learning dimension of cities, what cities do to help and foster and curate what people do for learning, that's shifting as well. Services, completely uh, changing. We heard a little bit earlier about the people being able to dial up you know, uh, the state of traffic so they can make journey uh, decisions. Lots of work being done around uh, open data and transport applications so that you can find your way around transport systems. I think I read the other day, there's no fewer than about 15 now or 16 separate third-party applications that have been developed off the back of open data and challenge opportunities in London just to find your way around London public transport. The place is just bursting with people who've got more and interesting ideas about how you use data to just something as basic and as critical as how you access service. Think of something like street lighting. So Cisco, Philips and a number of other partners in Europe are busy at, uh, looking at the whole issue of street lighting as a service. So the pole essentially becomes simply another node on the network and literally the lights get switched on and off when you damn well want the lights on and off and when you don't want them on, they get switched off and you save money, and you save carbon, and all the rest of it. And the city can basically buy that service from somebody who then owns the light pole and owns the rest of the service, but simply uh, um, the city can consume it as a service. Something as you know, fundamental as street lighting. Literally, we are, uh, ev we are getting to that point where everything uh, is part of the service. Um, and governance, I think we've heard a lot about. Um, in Boston, we've heard from the mayor who set up the... Um, um, a very interesting thing called the Mayor's Office of New Urban Mechanics, or MONUM. The office is essentially a new form of governance. It's a new form of the city talking with and learning from its citizens about how to solve problems. Same going on in San Francisco. Jay Nath, Chief, Info Chief Innovation Officer in San Francisco. Maybe we should have one of those here. But Jay Nath is basically doing uh, work around something called Engage SF, uh, innovate SF. If you read about what these stories are, essentially these are new ways for the city to talk to its own citizens about how the hell to solve problems. Not to complain, not to register that there are problems, but to come and actually sit and work remote, uh, uh, virtually and physically about how we can start solving them. New forms of governance, new forms of accountability, new forms of, um, of, of, of uh, uh, insight. Los Angeles, I'm told, is about to appoint um, a similar position, Chief Innovation Officer. Um, I mean, just much quickly, uh, before I finish, closer to home, um, we're doing some work at the moment with an outfit called Collab Forge in Melbourne. Some people in this room will know Collab Forge, Mark Elliott and his team. Some really nice work in Melbourne when they did their plan using a wiki. They've just set up something called City Lab, which is a little bit like some of the uh, sort of open space, open data and virtual and physical collaboration processes for city policy making and problem solving. So the governance conversation is shifting very dramatically and it seems to me it's, there are very few leading cities that you can read about that aren't experimenting with some form of using the digital dimension to change not just the nature but the quality and depth and value of the conversations they have with their citizens. citizens. So let me finish. So those are my three observations. It is disrupting deeply. We do seem to have a very resistant DNA to the people who we would like to pick this thing up and start actually reflecting it in the way they make policy and investment. Um, and the story from around the world is uh, we are, if anything, slightly behind the eight ball and the gap might well be growing between those cities who've <coughs> got it and are learning that this game is now completely different uh, and those who perhaps are a little bit slow off the mark. So the last sort of mantra I'd finish with, my sort of, um, the, the, the bottom part of my conversation is really to put this in your head, that in the end, the art and practice of connectedness has become a new civic capability in its own right. And the reason it's so important is because connectedness, and I mean that in a way to try and get over the notion that it's just about connectivity. If I can distinguish between connectivity as being essentially the technical part, you know, do the phones work, does the screen work, is there something on my iPad when I press the button that says yes, you know, go, that's connectivity. Connectedness is the other piece that we're talking about, that Saskia, Sasson and others talk about, the people, the people bit. So the art and practice of connectedness is becoming the fundamental new civic capability because it does one, a couple of important jobs. It puts innovation and productivity, urban productivity, at the centre of the debate and in fact is changing the way those two things happen. And once we get that going, innovation and productivity, then we're well on the way to the real outcome, which is how do we make our cities at a period of huge transformation and turbulence much, much more resilient. And that, I suspect, is the core. Thank you.